I actually yeah. don't know much about your background pre-Slade because I don't okay. really know much about oh, it. Oh, yeah, okay. okay. I actually started playing drums in the Boy Scouts. Okay. When I was about, I think I was in the Boy Scouts from when I was 11 until about 15 or nearly 16. I played, started playing drums, uh, I think I was about 14. I started playing drums, you know, the Boy Scouts sort of thing. But with the, the Boy Scouts uh, troop that I was in, before you could play drums, you had to play the bugle. And I couldn't get a bloody sound out. I, 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 no way. I used to stand with it up my mouth and just puff my cheeks out and pretend I was playing. And then, then, they, then they found me out and they said, OK, you can, uh, you can go and start to clean the drums. You know, they're, they're, they're big brass. Uh, they were like snare drums, but they were like the big deep ones, you know, mm -hmm. the military type things. And I, I was cleaning those for a few weeks before I actually got a, a chance to play. But I was I was so keen. My very first pair of drumsticks I made myself out of out of an artificial Christmas tree. You know, the stem off it. And I tell you what, I I sort of I I I'm sort of loving these. I was shaping them and doing everything. I'm going to choose. Just got got me uh, Boy Scouts pen knife and I was just like scraping them, did everything. And I was so proud of them. I stained them and I, you know I varnished them. And of course, in those days, not knowing anything about wood, the first time I hit, they broke. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I nearly cried. I was so disappointed. Yeah, you know, well, it took me about a couple of, well, about a month at least to sort of make these bloody things. But I mean, I, I wish I still had them. I was, you know, those things you never keep, do you? You know, what I mean. But I mean, I was so disappointed when they broke the first time. But that, that's what got me started. And then, um, oh, like the, the youth club I was a member of. Uh, I don't know how they found out. I must always, I must ask. No, I'm still I'm still in contact with them. So two guys, a singer, he played guitar as well, named Johnny Howells, and the rhythm guitarist Mickey Marson. Well, they came down to the youth club I was a member of and asked me. Yes, they said, you know, we've heard you play drums. I thought, well, I don't know, I don't know, know about that or anything. Anyway, they said we're after a drum. There's just the two of us, and would you like to um, play? And I thought, yeah, but I haven't got a clue. Uh, what, what it entailed or what you had to do and I hadn't got any drums at the, in, in those days and uh, one of my schoolmates David he, he lived around the corner he got some drums he had those, one of those old Olympic kits mm. you know sort of thing and, and let me use them or let me borrow them and I had those for must be about two years he never asked for them <laughs> back I, <didn't. laughs> I borrowed them you know and the thing was uh, Johnny our singer there was only him and his father and uh, that, like a guest house, uh, the, his dad used to do bed and breakfasts. And he had quite a big house, really. He had, uh, and the one, there was like a, a middle room in the house. And then off that room, there was a toilet. So when we used to practice, I used to, we used to put the drums in the toilet. And then um, and Johnny and Mick in, 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 the, in the front room sort of thing. And we used to be shouting to each other what we're going to play and all that. I mean, it was only playing like cover stuff then. In those days, it was like um, um, Joel Brown and the Brothers and Eddie Cochran and things like that. And, and Buddy Holly. I'd never heard of Buddy Holly then. I was, told, I was, I think I was, I was 15 at the time. I'd never heard of these people. Mm. The records that we played down the youth club were like Billy. Fury, Joel Brown, Eden Kane, you wouldn't know these people. Eden, you know, these they're, they're just like real pop records. And um, the very first record I ever learned to play drums to was Think It Of by Buddy Holly. And then and Peggy Sue, and I never heard drumming like that before, just like on the Tom Tom sort of thing. Mm. And um, and I'll make notes, there was um, the, the drummer, it was Buddy Holly and the Crickets, and the drummer was a guy named Jerry Allison. And if you watch any live stuff with him, he, he's incredible. Yeah, you know, for the time, he's very much uh, advanced for the time, really. And also uh, the drummer with Elvis, DJ Fontana. I mean, he was incredible, some of the stuff that he played. But in those days, it, you never thought about what you were doing. There's, you know, there's no sort of technical stuff or whatever. But it was just a, a great feel. If you listen to um, Hound Dog by Elvis Presley, the groove on that is incredible. That's DJ Fontana. And, um, 
and you, you you sort of see interviews with these guys, and they're just so so down to earth, so normal. Mm. And they they didn't realise what they were doing. They were they were just like the innovators, really, of all that stuff, you know. And um, but I was sort of reading. There's, there's lots of record, like I said, like um, Hound Dog, something else, and then I really got turned on by. Al Green, who was signed to Atlantic Records, and he's and I, I remember listening to the drums, and I thought, what a great snare drum sound! It's so deep, a fantastic yeah. sound. And then, as I got to know about these things, I suddenly, I was listening. I suddenly realised when he came to a fill, the snare drum went very thin, and then I suddenly realised on on the snare drum beat, it was a tom tom beat all the dub playing exactly the same thing mm. and that's what makes it so such a great deep snare drum sound but it's, it's a tom tom playing there as well so when he did a fill because he went thin because he comes off off the off of the tom tom off bit then you have a listen sometime you'll see well, what i mean I'll come back and listen. Mm. these little things that you hear when you get to know it's like, oh, now i know what he's doing and it's like uh, the tamla motown i could never the court the the because the tamla motown no, Barry Gordy, who formed Tamla Motown, he formed Tamla Motown on a bank loan. And um, he got it. And what all, all the people with Motown, like the Supremes, the Temptations, the Four Tops, it, it was the same band on everything, mm. on all their records. And what, what Barry Gordy did, the owner of Motown, they were all salaries, they were all on wages. So all those incredible hit records there, and they were still getting 100 hundred quid a week or something like that, mm. you know. But that if it started it, he he was paying them when there were nobody. And and I never realised they were called the Funk Brothers. They played these guys played on every Tamla Motown record. Yeah. And you can hear the drummer just the same fills on nearly every record. But it's incredible and it's just a great groove. You know, and I've been when I've been to the stage and I've been in Detroit and you see the, the Motown studios, I mean it's it's only just a tiny room and all these incredible records were made there i mean the equipment was nothing like it is now you know but i mean all these incredible records that were made there you now just all these classics you know just incredible really yeah and that's um and like i said and when you were asking about the playing the snare drum on, on nearly everything, like all, all our early hits, or most of our hits, would just be on snare drum. So I've noticed that. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the reason that came about is when we were rehearsing, it was, it was in this school, you know, one, of the, one of the classrooms, it, it was a disused school, but um, bands used to rehearse in the classrooms, you know, and there was a, a vicar who used to run, run this place, he was, I think he used to pay like 50p a day, you know, to rehearse there, sort of thing. And, and he could, the vicar could come round for the money, and he'd, he'd take he'd have about a five or after different bands that would play there, and he'd be straight up the pub going up for his point, you know, sort of thing. But uh, how, how that came about with the shuffle, it could be rehearsing because I love you, because it was like only a tiny room because everything was so loud. So I just went on the snare drum just to sort of keep it quiet. We suddenly thought, ding, that sounds great, we'll keep that. But I mean, like I said, not realizing like i said afterwards when i was listening to all these elvis presley records and all these early very early rock records that's all they played which is the snare drum you know it's just an incredible thing i mean the, the, it's nothing cluttered you know so there's not like you know lots of things going on and all that kind of thing and actually ringo plays the same thing on get back he plays just the snare drum and, and bass drum on get back but um Yep, that I mean that's how it was. Like it was just like anything, really. It was just a fluke. It just you know it just sort of uh, <laughs> just sort of that happened and it worked. Uh, and that I think you'll find that's where most things work. You know, just mm -hmm. just things that happen just off the cuff or whatever. You know. Yeah, I mean, because the the only other rock drummer that I can think of is Brian Downey from Thin Lizzy, the Shuffle Group. Oh, great. Um, no, I never heard him play that. Uh very second. UK tour, believe it or not, was Susie Quastro and Thin Lizzy. And uh, Susie had just come over from Detroit then, and Thin Lizzy, and that's when I um, met Brian, Brian Downey really then, and then obviously all like Phil Innes and Eric Bell, all that lot, sorry. <clears throat> and, uh, but we never kept in touch. I've seen Phil quite a few times, actually, 
me and Nod was with him the night that he died. Wow. We were out to some reception somewhere in London, when I was living in London, some reception somewhere, and we were out having a great time, you know, just reminiscing. And uh, then the next morning, Nod called me, he says, uh, have you heard the news? I says, what? He said, I found Phil dead. I said, what? Mind you, he was pretty well out of it the night before. Mm. You know, I think he, uh, I think he took uh, everything, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. I think if, if it moved, he just snorted it. You know, but uh, yeah, but I mean, lovely block. I think what helped us a lot in in the early days, because like we didn't want to sort of get stuck in the top of the pop thing and like as a pop band or something like that, you know, which we weren't really. But that was the image that was coming across. But we got offered, I think it was the very first festival ever in the UK called the uh, the Great Western Festival in Lincoln. Right. And uh, I think I think there's about. 60 or 70,000 people there, I think. And there's a great bill. There was The Who, Joe Cocker, 10 years after, quite, quite a few, you know, big people on it. And um, we got booked on that. And uh, we went on to booze. You know, they, we walked on and people were booing because we had been on top of the pops a few times, things like that, you know, not quite accepted. And we, uh, we came off to massive cheers and it just, it really broke us. And really that that's what really helped us a lot that did to try and get out of the pop thing or the, you know the pop uh, group sort of thing that helped us a lot you know really well, um, what year was that seven must have been must have been i would think 71. so that was kind of the time you would when you really felt the impact like well we've kind of made it yes yeah so we weren't just being accepted as, as uh, the band from top of the pops you know, we were taken seriously sort of thing. And it helped a lot, that did, it really did. And what was great as well was an actor called um, Stanley Baker. He's been in quite a few big films at the time. And he, he was one of the organisers. And uh, and Nod brought him on stage to sort of uh, introduce him to the crowd as the guy who's made this festival possible. And that, that went down a storm, that did. And uh, yeah, and it, it, really, it really broke us into... Um, a wider audience really Donna as compared with like, we, like I said we didn't want to get um, stuck into the top of the pops type thing you know and, and that really helped us and we, we were taken pretty seriously after that so it was really good and our very first tour was I think it was the same year was a, a co-headlining thing with us and us and Quo Wow. You know, uh, yeah, um, uh, the UK tour, and we've been mates ever since. Yeah. And would you believe that too? It was, uh, it was, um, it was purposely done by our manager, Chas Chandler. The ticket prices were fifty p all round. <laughs> you know, I mean, amazing when it there was no sort of like uh, balcony seat, so it was just fifty p all round, and, and consequently everywhere was sold out. And it was, it was a great tour. <laughs> Just 50p, that's incredible. Like, I can't even. I know. What, what can you get for 50p these days? Nothing. You know, Nothing like you. You, can't even, you, can't even, you can't even get a cup of tea. You know, <laughs> but, One of my favourite songs, Slate songs to play live, is Banging Man. Mainly because it's got cowbell. But I just, I really like the groove. Um, but obviously, yeah. it's something live, it's not necessarily the one you like when you recorded it. What was, what's your favourite song to play live back then or sort of nearer these uh, days? Era? And what is uh, I think far, far away from my favourite Slay song because that, that that was that particular time that was recorded that was 1974, and um, we were just touring the world non-stop. We hadn't got a clue where we were. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but I mean, fantastic. Don't get me wrong, it was fantastic, but uh, in those days it was before the Euro. So if we we're in Germany, we had Deutschmark. If we were in Holland, we had like uh, was it? Gilda, so I could always look at the money and see where I was. I thought, oh God, I've got Deutsche Mark, I'm in Germany. You know, so and that's what it was like, but it was fantastic. We were just touring non-stop. It was just like, just constantly touring all over the world, you know. I mean, our very first tour of Australia in 73 was us and Quo again, you know, and uh, we were doing big, um, big um, cricket stadiums, so on our average about 60,000 people. The night, and it was incredible, really. But I say my favorite uh, Slade song is, is, is Far, Far Away, mainly because of Nod's lyrics. Because, like I said, because we were touring non stop in those days, and uh, his lyrics are all about us touring. 
No, it was so. No, it was great. And I'm, I've got to mention the actually the engineer on that was a guy, uh, a guy named Alan O'Duffy, mm -hmm. who I still I'm still in contact with now, because we did all our early stuff at Olympic Studios in Barnes, and he was like the house engineer, and he he recorded all our early stuff. He recorded um, actually five of our six number ones. Wow. He, he was the engineer on and. Um, the sixth one was obviously Merry Christmas, but that was done in New York. But uh, Alan Oduffy, as I said, I'm still in contact with him now. And uh, lovely bloke, you know, sort of, he's so calm. I mean, all the things that go on in the studio sometimes, and he's still there, so calm, just with his cigarette, you know. He, he, you know, he, he don't get riled at all. He's fantastic. And he's still the same now. So going on from the live, the, live, the, the song you like to play live, is far, far away. The live. Well, far far away is one that I do like playing live. Uh, get down and get with it. I, I like I like most of them really. I used to like I used to like playing Thanks to the Memory. That was uh, one of the hits in in the um, seventy five I think it was. But we that was on piano, electric piano. So we did we only played that really. Uh, I think it was for one two of them we used to feature Jim on the electric piano when he played. Uh, we did uh, Thanks to the Memory. Um, film? And how does it feel from the film, Fading Flame, things like that, you know, but uh, yeah. But have you got another funny story or memory? Obviously, I know you've probably got a million, but is there anything that you can share with yeah, us? A, well, I, I don't know whether you know or whether a lot of people know, we played in the Bahamas in 1968. Okay. Right. We had this gig, we were still in Wolverhampton then, just, just still playing like pubs and clubs. Mm. And this gig came through this guy, he used to be a member of the youth club where we rehearsed, he was now living in the Bahamas. His sister was out there, married a bohemian, and blah, 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 come like that. And he saw this opening at this club. And he mentioned to uh, these people about, he knew us, about bringing us over to play for eight weeks. In the in the Bahamas, you know, the club was like, "What? What? That's the Bahamas? You only see that in the film, you know. We never seen, we never been on a plane before." And um, anyway, this is incredible. I always remember it was a, it was a Sunday we flew out. It was uh, when was it? It was uh, May May the nineteenth, nineteen sixty eight, and. Um, and it was on a Sunday, and I remember we'd never been on a plane before. We had to fly from London Heathrow. We had our, our equipment then was only like not not uh, Dave Dave Hill had an AC thirty each, and Jim had a, an eighteen inch Marshall uh, bass amp, and I had my Ludwig kit, and that just went down to excess baggage paid for by this businessman in the Bahamas. Anyway. We got there, and I remember getting off the plane and running back on. I thought the engines were still on. It was just, it was just, it was the heat when we got there. Never seen anything like it. And um, I remember this. That was in Nassau, the capital. And uh, the guy who, who we knew from our hometown, he met us there. Then we had a, a small half, hour, half hour, forty minute flight from Nassau to Freeport, where we were going to be playing. Now, remember this, we got there, this is like, I was all dressed in shirt, tie, all dressed up for this thing, and it was like nearly a bloody hundred degrees, and God, take, taking everything off. Now, but never seen anything like this. And of course then, we, were in, we got booked in this hotel. Now, we'd never been in a hotel before, Right, so we walk in and there was like um, two twin rooms with an adjoining door. Remember, Noddy Holder and Dave Bill had the one room. I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy Lee had the other room, but it was like an adjo adjoining room. So we had, we actually had a bed each, because normally we used to have four of us in one bed in these guest houses, you know, that kind of thing. And we had a bed each. I've never seen anything like this. And right outside the window, was like a, a lagoon where Frank Sinatra had his yacht, Sean Connery had his yacht. We'd, we'd never seen anything like this, Donna. And, yeah, and anyway, this was like in the afternoon with a time change and everything. And this guy came and said, listen, I'll let you have a little rest. He said, no, I'll come and pick you up and about eight or nine o'clock. I'll, I'll take you out. We're going to have something to eat. Anyway, he said, if you want anything, just pick up the phone and dial, dial room service. It's all being paid for. 
And we said, what's room service? <laughs> we said, we did, what's room service? We didn't know anything about this kind of thing. He said, just pick the phone up. There's a menu there. Just pick the phone up, dial that number there, and tell them what you want. Well, what, then what happens? So they'll bring it to you. Oh, we don't have to go and get it. No, they, they'll bring it to you. Just sign for it. Who pays for it? It's all being paid for. It just goes on the bill because we didn't know anything about this. Anyway, he took us out to to eat on the night and it was the same heat at night as it was during the day. I mean, we never never experienced anything like this. Anyway, the next morning, he said, we'll go to the club, you know, we had our equipment and whatever. And all of a sudden, we got this couple of taxis with this gear and um, we started driving towards the club. All of a sudden, the luxury started to disappear. And we started to become into a not very nice area of this island, right? And um, and then we get to this club, and it was a bit of a bit of a bit of a dump, you know, sort of thing. There's all these cockroaches all over the walls and everything, and these you know, these bohemians standing outside with cans of beer and smoking joints, just sort of stoned out their brains and all that kind of thing. We'd never seen anything like this. Anyway, we go in this club, and it's a real dive. It really is a real dive. But we thought, oh God, we just. I was, I, was, I was only 20 at the time, was, um, what we all were, and Jim was only 18. Anyway, sort of, I thought, well, we're here for six weeks, we're going to have a great time, I laugh for God's sake, you know. Anyway, sort of, um, you know, sort of, when we started, the dressing room was only like a tiny broom cupboard on the side of the stage, and um, when we went on, there's a lot of American kids there, but because of the, I don't, the situation, there's the curfew. Anybody under age, 18 and under, had to leave the club at 10 o'clock. Yeah. It was like a curfew. And it was just then, we were just playing to drunken, junky bohemians, you know, sort of thing. But we were having a great time because we were playing a lot, lot we didn't. And we didn't play our own stuff then. We were playing like Tamla Motel and then sort of some soul stuff. And they loved it because they, they couldn't understand four white kids playing Tamla Motel and stuff like that. You know, so anyway, we, we were having a great time. I mean, sort of, um, you know, it was like, you know, total paradise for us, you know. And then um, after a few weeks, uh, the club wasn't making that much money. There wasn't that many people. It wasn't making that much money. But uh, I remember the manager, his name was Duke. He said, I can't give you $100 a week each. He said, I can give you some. He said, well, we don't care because we got the hotel and we're eating and drinking there, you know, so we ain't really bothered. Just, just a bit of pocket money, really, but we didn't really need. Anyway, that was going on like that. And uh, after, about, after six weeks, we had two weeks left before we came back to England. After six weeks, the hotel manager sent for us. He says, you've got to come to, his, 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 his uh, oppo came, he says, you've got to come to see him. I remember his name, Mr. Darrow, the whole, he, he wants to see you. So we, we thought, oh, shit. So, we, you know, it was pretty early in the morning for us then. Anyway, so we just got our T-shirts and shorts on. I went down, sat with him. He said, well, what? I said, well, you've been here for six weeks now, living like kings. When am I going to get some money? I mean, mm. and we thought, well, the deal was it was being paid for. He said, and I don't know anything about that. And I thought, oh no, you know, you feel the blood drain from you, you know, sort of thing. And uh, and we said, ah, well, well, we're not really being paid by the club because it's making no money. That's the, that's the reason why we're still here, really, because like we've got our own uh, return tickets, our, our tickets, but we're not making any money because the club's making no money. He said, well, that's nothing to do with me. And we said, well, what do we owe? Now, remember, this is 1968. He said, at this moment, he got all the papers out. He said, $35,000. <laughs> that's, that's what we did. We just started laughing. <laughs> we couldn't believe it. We just started laughing. Because we, we've been living on room service now because we're not, I'm not having any money from the club. We, just, we thought we're a hotel. The hotel's being paid. So we, we just sort of... Uh, living on room service. Anyway, he said, well, he said, uh, well, this needs to be paid. He said, well, we go home in two weeks. He says, no, you don't. Not until this bill's paid. I'm like, well, what? He said, I'm not, I'm not, you're not leaving. He said, you're not staying in the hotel any longer. I said, well, where are we going to live? He said, well, I'm putting you, putting you in one of our staff apartments um, and you'll stay there until 
Which, oh, that's right. He said the club's been bought by two American guys from uh, Miami, which we didn't know anything about, and they're willing to pay you a hundred dollars between you, which I I will come down and collect seventy five off and give you twenty five dollars, which in those days was just about fifteen quid. Now for the week sort of thing between us. Anyway, we got to this little apartment. And it was just like a small stack, and I only meant for one person, at the most two. So we had four camp beds there, and we had a uh, that was in the lounge, so it was a small kitchen, which was part of the lounge, and a separate bathroom and toilets. And we were there for three and a half months. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I mean, people like this, 20 years old, we just we didn't give a fuck, we didn't care, <laughs> you know, so we were having a great time on, nice, on so. the beach, on the beach, everything. Yeah. Huh? I said you had a great time, so experience and all that. Yeah, down, down, down the beach every day. Anyway, then uh, we, oh, that's right. The, the hotel manager sent, uh, said, "Well, you don't know, but the club has been bought by two American guys from Miami, and they're going to give you a hundred dollars a week between you." So anyway, we go down to meet these guys, and they were all right. You know, they said that was it. We played the same. Though. On weekends, they used to, like well, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they used to bring acts over from Miami, but they never had a drummer, did they? I used to be on stage from 8 o'clock at night till 4 o'clock in the morning without a break. You know, there used yeah. to be a fire dancer, a limbo dancer. The limbo dancer was funny, because it's on your tiny stage. You'd be on dance, on stage dancing and whirling his sticks around. And I asked to keep on ducking, so, so I would get smacked in the head with one of his sticks. <laughs> yes, for that was... Every Friday, Saturday, and I spent on stage for about eight hours a night without a break. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But I mean, it was, it, was only 20, it was only 20 years old. We did, we just having a great time. In the end, we had to uh, sneak off the island, you know, because we'd, stay, we'd saved enough money to get our um, adequate back on because we had to, we couldn't leave that because we were still, it was still on HP. But we hadn't long got it then. And uh, so, we had to sort of save enough money to get that back home, and that's what we did. We had to sneak off the island in the end. But since then, that was in 1968. Since then, I made contact with two of the kids that was there. It was at school there at the time. There was like Penny. She is an English girl. She lives north of Liverpool. But I've met her again since. She's a grandmother now. Um, Randy, he was from uh, the States, he's living in Canada now, near Toronto, I think, yeah, something like that, and he's a grandfather as well, so it was great to, uh, you know, be in contact with them, you know, that was great. Wow. Well, so how, how are, are your hands there? after that as well, if you're playing yeah. like that long every night, but your hands are shredded? Sorry, what was that? Uh... I said, how are your hands after like, playing that long every night? I bet they were absolutely... It was, all, I mean, it was, it was different then. It was only, uh, it was only like soul stuff and Tamla Motown and stuff. Good. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't, it wasn't particularly, it wasn't rock stuff. It wasn't hard really. Yeah. But uh, yeah, because you couldn't play, I couldn't play like I do now because it wasn't that kind of thing then. You know, we're just playing quite, quite easy in those days, you know. So uh, yeah. But it was a great experience. <laughs> but it was great. I always been knackered. And then I remember we finished, I finished with the limbo dancer or the fire dancer or whoever, one of the soul singers. But then they'd have a break. Then our lot would come on and I'll be half asleep on my drums. They'd give me, come on, it's our turn now. <laughs> but uh, no, it was, it was quite funny. Quite funny. Okay. But I mean, I'd love to go back. I made, uh, I was worried though, in case I got arrested. Because of the big hotel bill, you see. But uh, I found out since I made inquiries, I found out from the authorities on the island, I'm more than uh, welcome to go back because it wasn't a criminal offence. It was oh, like between us and the hotel. And I mean, the hotel manager probably lost his job. But, um, you know, but I mean, at least I know I can go back without. I was worried in case I got arrested as soon as I got there. But yeah. uh, now it's all right, I can go back. I'd love to go back to see. But I, like the, the two people I've met since, like uh, Penny and, and Randy, they said it's not the same place anymore. They, they, used to, they used to all meet up there a few years after that, after we were there, um, have like a school reunion. But uh, um, then it was great. But now it's quite not. The same anymore isn't it? it's not a friendly place apparently anymore but you could oh. see that kind of thing happening uh, happening then you know a lot of people 
a lot of like how it started. I was watching uh, programs. The mafia used to because it's, it, it's there's no it's it's tax free there. There's no tax on that on the islands, okay. and um, the mafia were hiding all their money there. Yeah, they were sending the money down, and that's what a lot of people started doing. And like the mafia money was used to build the hotels and all the casinos on the island, and that, that they started the, the Bahamas really. But uh, but you could see you could see the you know like it, it wasn't getting a very friendly place after. Well, just about just before we left, you could see the, there was trouble there, trouble mm -hmm. brewing. But um, but you never hear about it now, do you? Like uh, I mean, you you always used to see it on on holiday brochures, but not, it's not the same anymore. I'd love to go back though just to see it, you know. You should, I won't be arrested. Mm. Uh? you should do that. Once we're out of COVID, then you should you should go and have a look. I'd love to, but the, the club the club probably ain't there anymore. It's probably in, mm. it was in a real rough part of the island. It was a bit of a dump anyway. <laughs> it probably got knocked down ages ago. <laughs> Unless Seth Fox would be surprised if somebody burnt it down. But uh, <laughs> now it was a, it was an experience to say the least. I bet, I bet you improved a yeah, lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I used to live in Thailand for a bit, for like just over a that. year. Yeah, and I got I managed to get myself a gig okay. um, in a pub every Friday night. So they were really good at playing yeah. like songs, but obviously they played Thai, Chinese, Korean songs. And I was like, I don't know what I'm playing. Just got yeah. it. I came <laughs> back. I really realised how much I improved from when I left. I was like, oh, bloody hell! Oh, oh yeah. You yeah, you don't really, you don't, you don't realise at the time, do you? Really, you don't think at the time. I mean, yeah, but uh, no, it was a, it was a fantastic experience. Yeah. You know, fantastic. Yeah, you know, like I said, we'd never been in a hotel before, and uh, you know, things like that. You know, and, uh, yeah, and see, they always seem to say, in, in the back of your door of the hotel, make sure you check your bets for spiders and snakes before you get in. You know, I thought, oh no, I don't need this. <laughs> I don't need this. You know, but luckily we never saw anything. You know, it, <laughs> okay. we met one, we met one guy there, a Portuguese guy. I always remember his name was Vaino. He's was, he was like nearly seven foot tall. He was always, he was always sort of stoned out of his box, and and he was he was always in swimming shorts. But every part of him, he was, he was covered in scars. And I hadn't got my nerve to ask him. He looked like he'd been caught in a machine. Anyway, one time I did ask him, and what he used to do as a nutcase, he used to wait for the American tourists to come over from Miami. He used to go out on the boat with them. They'd find the shark. He'd dive in and fight the shark. And like, they would film him with his, with the whole, with their Sydney cameras. I, and half a wonder if he's still alive. <laughs> and that's why he was covered in, that's why he was covered in scars. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah what, oh, yeah, I know what I'll do for a living. I'll fight sharks. <laughs> but you know, it, was, it was a great experience. Great experience. It definitely moulds you. Yeah, well, the thing is, I mean, after that experience, we decided then we, we, we were going to try and make it then. We'd had a really sort of three and a half months of being stuck there with no money. We hadn't got any money at all. And the kids used to feed us. And um, we said then, now we're going to go and try and make it. And that's when we met Josh Chandler after that. We played this, we had a recording audition. And uh, that's when we met Josh Chandler. And, and the rest is history. Wow. You know, he, he, was, he was great for us. Mm. I mean, you know, now he was fantastic when we met Charles because, I mean, he knew the ropes. Remember, he was, the, they were sort of the animals, you know, he was the bass player with the animals, and they were massive all over the world in the 60s. And he was the guy that discovered Jimi, Jimi Hendrix. You know, so, um, yeah. I mean, uh, a, a, yeah, a great, uh, great guy to be with, you know. He knew, he knew the ropes, he knew exactly... Yeah, you know, things were so it was great for us. The rest is history. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I mean, he 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 sort of like he, he produced all our early records. Well, most of them. You know, he produced nearly all our records up to. I think it was um, my oh my was produced by somebody else. My oh my and run runaway was produced by uh, another guy in London. You know, who was uh, signed to a recording studio. That was his management, and that was uh, John Punter. And he, he produced uh, My Arm, My Arm, Run, Run Away. Yeah. And they were both hits in America. Wow. You know, so, yeah, so uh, no, it was good. You learned a lot from him. Mm. You got some, got some nice, they're your keyboards. They're actually my dad's. Um, I, ha I haven't really played them much. I probably should. Um, 
Yeah, this is our music room. So I've got some my actual drums here, obviously tucked away. Okay. Some of my snares in the back there, maybe my toms. I can see that. And I've got you, my you found a 14 inch or a 13 Okay, yeah, I've um, got my stuff up there. We, we, what's that? That snare there. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a 14 inch. Yeah, 14. Pick a line. A 14 inch. Yeah. Nice. I've got, uh, nice. Yeah, I've got four different ones, so a pick. Yeah, that, that was another thing when we started to tour America, when we were in Chicago. I was taken around the Ludwig factory and I, I got introduced to Bill Ludwig the first and mm. second and they gave me a great deal. I, I never had to pay for anything of Ludwig, I had everything for nothing. Wow. And uh, yeah, and it was, it was a great company. It's not the same anymore, it's not, it's not owned by the, it's still called Ludwig Drums, but it's not the Ludwig family anymore, mm. you know, they sold it. I think it's in the 80s they sold the company. I don't know why, but um, yeah. And it was, it was a great company. You know, no matter where you were in the world, you could get anything you want to. You know, I could send, if I needed this, I remember in, in Tokyo, when we were in Tokyo, I needed something to do with my. Sorry, I think. Are that, you there? Yeah, sorry, I think that was me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, that's been a great, great talk then, uh, Donna. Yes, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. No, um, it's been really, really great. I knew we would be though, figure. So uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll see you around sometime. Yes, definitely. I would love to have another chat at another point. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, we can arrange that with Dave. That won't be a problem. We'll you, know, you know, arrange it with Dave, eh? Okay. Excellent. Anyway, thank you so much for your time, Donna. Really appreciate it. And have a nice time. Where you okay, are. thanks. Take care of where you think. Uh, I'll, I'll keep, keep well, keep well, and we'll speak soon, eh? Yes, excellent. All right, thanks so much, Don. Okay, thanks a lot. Take care, Donna. Bye. Okay, bye.